So this is going to be a political economy slash banking paper. It's joint work with uh, Susanna, who was mentioned as uh, part of uh, the team at Buffett, uh, and Laurent Weil, who is also at Buffett uh, Research Fellow at the moment. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers myself. It's been a pleasure to be here every time, and it's a, a pleasure again. So, okay, what is the motivation of this paper? We all know that uh, banking is a very heavily regulated sector. Uh, banks have a whole load of government-imposed constraints in any country in the world. Uh, and you could say, actually, that maybe banking is even more regulated than nuclear energy. Huh? And the reason is possibly the same, because banking, just like nuclear energy, can pose severe externalities on the environment. Huh? So we need to regulate it. Uh, and banking, uh, the regulations are, and we all know this, uh, and it's the same in Europe, in the US as in Russia, the capital rules, and one, and three, you know, all the rules as bank experts. Bank uh, standard. You have uh, liquidity rules, leverage rules. You have limitations of, on their behavior of all kinds of sorts. Now we also have limitations on the bonuses and all kinds of limitations. And the reason is, of course, they are systemically important. We cannot let them fail. And if they fail, they would create externalities. That's the reason. So, what does it imply? It implies that banks, uh, as a sector, have a really good reason to develop a political strategy because they're so heavily regulated, being able to steer the regulation or to have good political connections has a lot of value for banks around the world. Uh, what forms could it take, and that's also something that we see in every country, you see capture by private interests. So you see that uh, the banking sector as a whole tries to capture the government and tries to strike deals that are beneficial for the banks. You've seen it many times. Uh, uh, there's a general finding in the theoretical literature that this kind of government capture of a where one sector captures the government and basically is able to dictate the regulation is stronger in industries that are concentrated, regulated and oligopolistic. And I, would, I would say banking is a very good example of this. So you can expect from theory that banks try to capture the government. What are the examples? Lobbying, campaign financing, very predominant in the US uh, by the banking sector. Remember the Glass-Steagall Act, how it was repealed in 1998 when uh, uh, the American president was very weak on the Lewinsky scandal and it was replaced, uh, replaced finally by the Financial Modernization Act, the Grand Blady uh, Act. Uh, you can also think of about the bailouts. If you think of the 2008 crisis and how the bailouts were structured, you can see that in the end it was a massive bailout of bank shareholders that actually were, had nothing, the banks were bankrupt and they were replenished and it's the taxpayer that paid. So the whole bailout was basically a transfer from taxpayers to bank shareholders, essentially, and bank depositors. If you think of it, why, why is that possible? Why don't the shareholders lose their money uh, at the moment you save the banks? They took a risk. When it was going well, they got big dividends. If it goes wrong, the government pays. That's kind of strange. And, and that's because of this political situation. You also have it at individual banks. Also, individual banks may have good reasons to have a political strategy. You, you have the whole story about revolving doors between banks and governments. So you, you see, at many, and there's many examples, you have uh, Paulson, you have Draghi, you have many, many others, where you see that people that used to be in the government or the regulator end up as a director of a bank, or the other way around, people that were at the head of a bank end up at the Ministry of Finance. Paulson was uh, at Goldman Sachs before he became Minister of Finance and saved Goldman Sachs. And you can say, wait a second. You have a former boss of a bank that becomes Minister of Finance and then use taxpayer money to save the same bank. That's kind of awkward, in a way. So, and this is also the same in any, any country. So you, it means you have preferential treatment of individual banks. It could be uh, some help to deal with regulations. It could be access to government deposits, like upon the Mochni Banki in Russia. Eh? So you're a bank and you, the government departments deposit money with you or government funds or special government contracts. Maybe they will close an eye, uh, they turn a blind eye uh, if you violate some rule. So there's reduced uh, oversight. There's some evidence this happens in Russia too. Uh, maybe you have forbearance. If you breach the rule, if you don't conform to the standard, maybe they let it pass through. Uh, and maybe there are some bailout expectations. Maybe if you, put, if you have a good political connection because you're government owned or because maybe a foreign politician is in the board or a director, maybe people assume this bank will never be bankrupted. The government will save it. There's an implicit guarantee, right? And these things have been proven in many countries, so there's nothing new here, actually. It's been solidly proved. 
Um, I have a paper myself in, on Turkey that shows the following. Banks that appoint politicians uh, as a CEO, or as chairman of the board, they get implicit guarantees and forbearance. So what you see essentially, you see that the positive discipline, the extent to which depositors care about bank fundamentals, diminishes. So if you put a politician at the head of the bank, depositors will bring more deposits at a lower interest rate, conditional on the capital. So the depositors care less about how healthy the bank is. They assume there's a politician there, the bank is going to be saved anyhow, so it's like it's a guar implicit guarantee. Uh, um, so that's kind of clear. However, all the stuff I've been saying now has been about the helping hand, right? The government helping the banks, the banks trying to use the government to help themselves. But it could be the other way around. Maybe there's also a grabbing hand. Maybe politicians could use the banks for their own political or personal purposes. So there's two sides to this problem. Who is, who is getting something here? Is it the bank or the politician? And there's quite some literature, I will not go over all to them, but there's some literature showing that actually, indeed, there is this grabbing hand hypothesis and that political connections, uh, they do matter and they buy something for the government. Uh, so there is something like this. We have a paper ourselves on Russia, in fact, where we look at the Spets banks. Uh, so the privatized former Soviet banks used to be more than 800, but many of them are still alive today, these uh, former specialized banks. Uh, and what we see is that regions with more of these banks per capita have indeed more lending. So indeed having these privatized banks increases lending in the region, but they do not see more growth. In fact, in some regions less, but they see more employment. This is a kind of mystery, how you can combine these things, but it seems to me that the answer to the mystery is uh, political connections. And so what happens is that many of these formerly privatized banks, not all of them, but many of them, tend to finance zombie firms. And zombie firms are privatized big state firms that don't really grow, they don't really die, they just go on forever doing the same thing. Um, and it's like an equilibrium. But uh, it's, of course it prevents greater destruction, nothing will change. How do you see this? This is the Spets banks per million population. Uh, and so every dot is a region. So you have all the regions of Russia. And you have the Spets, the Spets bank density, you could say. And this is the lending per capita. And you see kind of a positive correlation if you actually split the regions. So what did I do? I split the regions down the median, high spats bank, low spats bank. And then you just look at lending. And if you start from 97, you see the high spats bank regions really see more lending growth than the low spats bank regions. So having these former state banks, now known under a, a completely different name, often just a private bank, uh, have more lending, which is great, but there's not more income. The income is no diver diverge of income. Huh? And the reason seems to be political connections. Um, so if you look at the Spets banks and the other banks, you see, look at the directors. The percentage of uh, directors that are actually politically connected means, in this case, still from the old system working in Promstoy Bank or Zizat Bank or Agapon Bank. So having banking relations with state firms from the old system. That's what I mean. And you see that of these Spets banks that, that now are, are just co private commercial banks, it's, a, uh, uh, well, it's three quarters and in normal banks it's just one quarter. So this is the thing. So these, these banks, although they're now private and privately owned, they keep doing the same thing because they have a history with their, with their firms. Okay. The last point, and that's actually the topic of this paper in the end, politicians could also use banks to get elected. There's a big literature with similar work of Dinge, but many others, that and it's true in every country, and especially in emerging countries, what you see ahead of elections, you see that state banks lend more money. And the idea is, the theoretical channel is, by lending more money, there will be more growth, more employment, and that will be go good for the incumbent politician. And he will be re-elected. And you see that in every country, that indeed it's true, uh, in the whole OECD, state-owned banks increase lending in election years relative to private banks. Uh, and the effect is especially strong in non-OECD countries. So it's uh, even true in Belgium, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so it's true everywhere, uh, politicians use banks. Uh, uh, but it's especially true in emerging market countries. So we would expect it to be true, of course, in Russia.
And that's where I get to the essential topic of this paper. So uh, Putin becomes prime minister in 99. Uh, at that moment, he's unknown and popular. While, while today, you could say he's very well known and very popular in Russia. So he, but he's, he, when he comes into the game, he's new, Putin. And I remember the first mentionings, it was very, very interesting. Uh, of course, it's uh, related to the Chechen war. It's probably also related to bringing stability and economic welfare and increasing pensions uh, and law and order, definitely. And the interesting thing is he had a new party unity. It was founded very, very shortly before the December 99 elections, I think two or three months. It had no clear program other than the desire to support the government. And they got 22% of the Duma elections. That's kind of nice, but okay. Uh, that's, uh, this is the, the usual way uh, it goes in Russia. You have a, a prime minister, he founds the party, and the party wins the elections. We had it, with, uh, had it uh, at the time with uh, Jablok in the very beginning. We had it with Czerno Mirdin, who had Najdom Rassie. <coughs> we had it with Primakov, who had Atletsos Rassie. And we had it with Putin. So it's a, it's a logical political uh, uh, consequence in, in Russia. Uh, but now, the more interesting thing is, uh, you all know the story, uh, Yeltsin abdicates in the New Year's speech of December 1999, uh, and Putin becomes acting president. And then there is an early presidential election in March 2000. And there he wins with a landslide victory. So the, there's a massive increase in popularity from December 1999 to March 2000. A really big landslide increase in popularity. And the question is, how? Why is that the case? That's an interesting question. Some people say it's media coverage, uh, and the story would be it's due to NTV. This is old research, it has been published. Uh, it has been published in many journals, uh, the PINAS, uh, uh, political economy uh, journals. So basically, uh, forget about the, the, the text, I will show you some figures. So you know NTV, but at the moment when, when the, the elections were taking place, NTV was run by Guzinski, and he was fiercely opposing Putin. So there was, at the time, one channel that was critical of, of uh, Putin. Not, not today. Uh, today it changed, of course. Um, but, uh, so it had some effect, but uh, the, media, the media coverage, but at least there was some competition. So you could say, if there was any election honest, it was probably the 2000 election. Because there, there was some real political op opposition that had media and TV, and, and you could see uh, everywhere that so, some people did not agree with the regime. Um, this is a figure, I, I, it's more or less visible. It's a published figure, so I'm, I'm telling nothing new. And all, every triangle is a transmitter of NTV. NTV at the time was not using cable, it was using transmitters in the air. And we know the geolocations of all the transmitters. So you put it on a map, and you, so you see where there's a lot of black, there's a lot of NTV coverage. And there we would expect Putin is less popular and the opposition is more popular, right? So think about this dot, this dot, and this line here. Right? Keep that in mind. The next figure, you will see the votes for unity. And you see white, white, white. So in those regions where NTV was heavily watched, uh, Unity didn't do very well, actually. However, o OVR, the competition at that moment, Atletsch eh? uh, Farasiad was uh, of the, the mayor of Moscow and Primakov. Black, black, black. So you clearly see there's a, the relation, but it also shows it can't explain the big line slide victory of, of Putin, because there was real competition. So it's not a good explanation. Some people say ballot stuffing. Uh, I don't, I don't believe that's true, not in two, at least not in 2000. Uh, because in 2000, you still had the Communist Party that was going strong. They had local representatives everywhere. They had a strong candidate, Shuganov, who still mattered at the time, really was an important uh, figure. So it's very hard to do ballot stuffing uh, if there's so much uh, political competition. In 2012, however, it's something else. This is the 2012. This is just a, on, just a plot of the online data. It's on, on the peak level, every polling station. So the data is public. It's just an Excel sheet, and you get just, uh, it's a scatter plot of all the polling stations. And what do you see? This is the turnout, so the percentage of voters that actually show up. And this is how many of them vote for uh, uh, the, 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 the party of uh, unity. And you see, the higher the turnout, the higher uh, the amount of votes for uh, the party of Putin. It could be that their voters are more motivated 
But this is also very strange. These two, oh, these two points are very strange, right? So you see that where the turnout is 100%, which is by itself strange, almost everybody votes for unity and uh, the zero votes for the, the opposition. So that suggests something strange is going on. Uh, okay, so let's skip some slides. Pum, pum, pum. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to think about this Bergbank. And the idea is uh, very simple. Putin came to power. Is it maybe true that, so we, we know uh, politicians around the world use state bank lending to get elected. Uh, but the same happened in Russia. And we have internal data from Sberbank. We know, uh, and I got this data in 2001, I never used them, this data. Uh, we have lending data uh, within Sberbank of firm ruble credits by month and by region. So we know how many credits Sberbank gives to a certain region in a certain month uh, in the year 2000. And so what we're going to do, we're going to basically say the increased popularity between December 99 and March 2000 is it driven by increases in lending. So do we see correlation between Sberbank lending to a region goes up just before the election and the popularity goes up? That's the idea, right? Um, we're going to control for many other things. Uh, so this is the main explanatory variable the change in Sberbank firm credits to the region in the month before the election, but you're going to control for Sberbank credits to households, and we're going to control for domestic private bank credits to firms in the same regions, to make sure it's not just a business cycle effect or regions doing well, getting more credits in general. And we're going to do also placebo regressions. We're going to look in other months not related to the elections. So this is basically the very simple specification. The change in the vote, is it a function of the change in uh, credits of Sberbank to firms, credits of Sberbanks to households, and credits of private domestic banks to firms? And you have some regional controls and you have some stuff. That's the regression. Yeah. And we're going to look for this alpha 1, and basically if alpha 1 is positive, only in the months for the election, there's some political effect of Sberbank lending. That's the idea. Right? So... Or let's skip this because I have little time and show you the result right away. This is the summary stats of the variables. So maybe you have to look at the Putin gain on average 16%, which is in, in three months pretty impressive. Um, and this is uh, the Sberbank variable of firms, households, and private domestic banks. And you see Sberbank is massive 20%, 13%, and 3% of the private banks. Okay. So first results, the dependent variable increasing popularity, the Sberbank firm loans, Sberbank household loans, so there's uh, two monthly changes. Uh, and then we control for urban population, educated middle class, defense employment in 85, distance from Moscow, ethnolinguistic fractionalization, and agricultural subsidies. And these are uh, measured uh, in, the, in 92 or earlier. So these are like structural drivers of w which regions would like Putin more because of their preferences. And you see that just before the election, so these are the months before the election, it hits. But that doesn't still, doesn't still mean anything. It could be, it's a tree in every month. It could be that these regions just get more spare back credits always. So to make sure this is any result, you also should look in the months before the election, right? So look in the months before the election. Okay, so this is uh, what we see. You look at the same the months before the election, Further, further down, and we have it further till the very beginning, but it doesn't show, it's too big for the slide. And there you see, it's, it's absent. But you could still say, wait a second, maybe it's a, it's a seasonal effect, because the election was January, so the, the period before the election was the winter. And maybe some regions get in winter more Sberbank loans, because they need gasoline or, or the cost of coal, these things, it's possible. So maybe we should do the same thing after the election and take the same, the same winter, take uh, November, December uh, 2000, instead of November, December 99. So the result was uh, November, December 99 is the strongest result. Let's, let's look at November, December 2000, and then the data stops, unfortunately, because I got it in 2001. So let's look after that period. This is after the period, yes? One minute. One minute. And you see again, oh, after the period, nothing there. November, December 2000, nothing there. So, so the correlation seems to be there only 
and we have uh, only and, and the month just before the election, which is kind of interesting. It's still not clear what the mechanism is. Uh, maybe, so is it really Yeltsin making a decision? We can't prove that at all. It's just a correlation. Maybe uh, some regional leaders appointed by Yeltsin uh, did a stronger effort. Maybe it's state employment. Maybe in regions with a lot of state employment, that's what happened. Maybe it's wage arrears. So the, then the logic is Bank gives loans to firms. The firms pay off the wage arrears on the understanding you have to vote for the right party. Maybe it is uh, Siloviki, huh? regions where there's a FSB or a military guy in, in power. So we look, we look at, uh, at the state employment, and this is kind of what we find. So what we do, we do the same regression. We just interact this bank variable with the state firm's employment, just a number, and, uh, and then this is dummy, high state employment, low state employment regions. And you see, in fact, when state employment is high, the effect is smaller. So it's going to, no, it's not state firms, it's private firms. Actually, I think privatized firms. So the channel seems to be, the Sberbank loans go to privatized firms and the managers understand what is happening. And they say, I will rally, I will tell my workers, they should vote for the right guy. And actually many polling stations are in these privatized firms, in fact. Now, let's look at the, uh, the appointed governors. So this is a po a governors appointed by Yeltsin or Putin. Some were appointed, some were elected. No effect. And then you look at, uh, this is kind of interesting. This is if the, so just looking at CVs, this data from Tsurskov. If the uh, governor is a former FSB, that's just a CV, you c it's, it's public, or a military, a military career, then you see this, a huge effect. And the interesting thing, the main effect disappears. And that's the last thing I will say and conclude. So the main effect, which is always there, all at once disappears. So it seems to be that actually we're wrong. It seems to be that it's not a central decision by Putin to use the banks to get elected. It's the opposite, because the, the Sberbank loans do not have any effect only in regions where there's an FSB or military. So what seems to be happening is that at the moment Putin was prime minister, in those regions where there were military people or FSB people uh, that had power, they saw it as an opportunity, an occasion. They say, oh, Let's rally to get this guy into power. And they, you, they uh, uh, got, got out, they went to the Sberg Bank, got the Sberg Bank credits, convinced the manager of their firms, and they got the votes out. So it only happened in those regions. Um, which is kind of, so it's still hard to understand, but the interpretation is uh, that security-related interests saw Putin's rise to power as an opportunity and rose to the occasion. So it was not kind of an organized thing, it was kind of seeing opportunity and taking it. Uh, that's my interpretation. So conclusion, and I stop there. There's an interesting correlation between the increase in Sberbank from ruble credits and increase in popularity of Putin. It's something that we see in every country. So, so Russia is not too special actually. St state bank lending is used in many, many countries for political purposes. Uh, it's not due to regional growth perspectives because we have all these regional controls. Uh, and we also control for private bank lending. It's not to, to deeper drives of bank bank credit because they're also controlled for. Um, and we also have the placebo regressions in other, other years. It confirms literature in many ways, but it's well identified. Because this whole literature is uh, uh, between countries and between banking systems. Now we have within a country and within one bank, and within one big state bank. So it's a very clear identification. So it suggests, okay, a strategy of using bank loans for political gains can be successful, but it's also suggestive of the fact that Siloviki saw an opportunity in bringing put into power and they used this bank to do that. And I will stop here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kuhn. Um, the discussion, discussion from the cost of from Isaac Higher School of Economics. Okay. So you have some five to seven minutes. Okay. Here we go.
Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, so I was really enjoying reading Kuhn's paper uh, together with Susanna and Laurent. Um, uh, very interesting read, very um, also nice to remember like uh, things that happened 15 years ago that were this was still a different country. Um, so I, I give a very brief summary uh, of uh, what the authors find. So they explore a new explanation for Vladimir Putin's rise to power, namely the channeling of channeling of loans through the uh, uh, dominant state on Sperbank to firms who should ensure election turnout of their workers in exchange. So and they find evidence that the difference between the regional votes in the parliamentary election in 1999 and the presidential election three months later, March 2000, um, is associated with more loans from Sperbank between November 1999 and January 2000. So this is evidence for what they call in the paper the carrot hypothesis. So, so they um, providing the loans uh, before the, the election. Okay. Uh, and there are other significant variables, uh, uh, the educated middle class and distance from Moscow. So the first positive, the last uh, negative. Uh, there are no effects found for uh, earlier or later month. So th the later month that would be evidence of the reward hip hypothesis. So you, ha you show a good uh, result in the election and then you get rewarded with more loans. So that is not the case. Um, and an interaction term of Sperbank loans with a dummy variable for a governor coming from military or federal security service has a positive effect, while interaction of loans with employment share and state firms has a negative vote, uh, effect on the vote difference. So let me skip this for sake of time. I uh, wrote, I think, to Kuhn presented the timeline. The really important thing is that this was very shortly, so there was just three months. Uh, between end of uh, so mid of December uh, Duma elections and end of March um, uh, parliament uh, presidential elections and maybe uh, so the numbers so we had in the Duma elections so the the parties that later on supported Putin were the uh, Unity Party uh, with 23 percent and the All Russia Fatherland All Russia Party with 13 percent so together. Uh, something like uh, 36, um, while the communists had 24. And then in the uh, presidential election, Putin got, uh, in the first round, 53%. So a huge increase. Um, um, and the rival Zyugana from the Communist Party also increased, but n by far not, not that much. So here are my comments. Uh, the first one, so I, um, I was really suspicious. I'm really suspicious of the story, I must admit. I'm not convinced. Uh, it could be all a coincidence. So let me spell this out. Um, so basically what the authors are doing, so, so you run cross-sectional regressions, number of observations is between 53 and 61. And results are significant only for two months. So, so they also they, these pairs of matches like rolling windows. Okay, so it's November, December, and then December, January. So why is January, February not uh, uh, significant? Because that was still before the elections, um, and the carrot just before the election would work best. You give these guys loans, and then months later they all turn out, uh, tell their workers turn out to vote. Um, in general, loans are lumpy, so the result might be driven by, by a few uh, large loans. So, uh, just to come up with the story, so it's conceivable that in December 1999, which enters the two windows where the effect is significant, so three or four big loans were given to region in Russia's European part, so not too far from Moscow, that happened to have a KGB governor and a um, larger private sector and higher share of the middle class, and then they vote more for, Put for Putin. So if these cases drive the result, uh, so we cannot really talk about the systematic support of Putin by the state, uh, the, the largest state-owned bank. So I would suggest checking whether the results are robust to the removal of a few observations. I think that that would um, make make the results stronger. So if you still find that that uh, even like uh, uh, cutting out maybe four or five observations that that 
potentially could drive the result uh, that would make it much stronger. Also, I was thinking, so, so is there any anecdotal evidence for loans given against election turnout for voters? So after all, in 2000, Russia still enjoyed a relatively free uh, regional press. So I, I was wondering, so, so why you could find anything that, that would, uh, I mean, come up uh, with, with the story of this. Um, and additional evidence could come from the difference between the vote and the presidential election and previous opinion polls. Uh, and also, so uh, I got another idea during your presentation that you could use turnout. I mean, you showed this nice slide. So why don't you uh, predict voter turnout uh, by um, spareback loans? So it could be like as a auxiliary uh, regression thing. Okay. So that was my first, maybe most important comment. Then um, you kind of dismiss this alternative story of the media control. Um, Obviously, uh, in later elections, the, the media control was more uh, complete. But here you have the chance, basically, so there's a regional variation no? there where people had access to, to the opposition channel, which later they didn't because NTV was not an opposition channel anymore. So I, th I would still put it as a control variable, uh, the, the, uh, the possibility to receive uh, the uh, NTV. Um, so now the next point I think is uh, linked to what they were saying. So in principle, the results are consistent with the story where loans were channeled to more progressive region with higher private sector share, educated middle class. Maybe there was a KG progressive uh, uh, KGB governor. Um, and also we need to remember that the vote for Putin was the progressive vote because the, the, the other candidate were representing the old communists. You know. So, uh, and third comment um, is, um, ex so you're excluding a lot of, uh, of different, but I guess it's, it's just due to the, the, the available data, but still uh, we need to be aware. So, so also you m I think you should make the reader aware of these exclusions a little bit more. So if you look at uh, central bank statistics, so uh, it, this was a period where, first of all, the, the, the uh, loans, so, so there, there was a credit expansion. So there's a lot more loans. In one year, in 1999, just the, the ruble loans, they more than doubled from January to December. Uh, and also, uh, and, and the foreign currency loans, they did not. They stayed more or less constant. So there was kind of a substitution of foreign currency loans for ruble loans on the way, so that it might not be even, so, so there might be a rollover of, uh, of a debt that has, that used to be foreign currency and now it's a ruble loan. So many of these are maybe not really new loans. Um, and you exclude Moscow, so I looked at the uh, regional uh, breakdown of, of the total lending to firms uh, in Russia, what the central bank reports. So of course there it's not the uh, the borrower's location, but it's the lender's location, it's the bank's location, what they look at. So this this is um, uh, so it's not one to one match, but it's, I think it should be close. So there you see that in the ruble loans, Moscow City ha alone had 78 percent and 89 uh, percent of the foreign currency loan. So excluding Moscow basically excludes most part of lending in, in Russia. So just I think you should be uh, explicit, uh, be a bit explicit about that. And the rest are some minor comments that I can pass you uh, by an email. Okay, thanks very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me propose so that in the interest of time, if, if there are some questions from the audience, we would group the group the questions and then we will give Kuhn an opportunity to to reply to those of the comments that you, you sort of think make make some most sense given the time limit. Um Andre, uh, uh, have a comment. Can I make a comment or shall I give it a Sure, sure you can make a short comment. Yeah. Um, <coughs> um slavery was abo served was abolished in Russia in eighteen sixty one four years earlier than in the land of the free the United States. So people who work at the enterprise of the state-owned enterprises are free. So the mechanism that the authors try to seem to allude is that the lending by the bear bank uh, can benefit a company 
and then the, the managers of that, that company can, can, can somehow influence the vote of the workers. I don't see how that might work. These people are free. So whatever that happens to the company, uh, uh, you know, cannot take the vote. Because it would be the same to a room that, you know, you work for a state of the university, but then if the rector gets an order, can a rector influence your vote? Of course not. You would say, well, your ballot is secret and it's nobody's business, and you would disregard. I personally know people who work the state owned companies, even some of the Silovikis. And you know, they have voted for LDPR, for the communists, and whoever. In Russia, most of the voting is actually protest vote. Essentially, people don't vote for, and people vote against. And this explains the rise of some parties like LDPR. Now, that suggests an alternative mechanism. Uh, if I may offer, yeah, like an sure, sure, sure. improvised an alternative story of what's happening. The allocation of beer bank loans somehow encourages firms that are doing better. And those firms are located in more stable regions, which have better prospects. Now, uh, it's not surprising that the people who live in these regions and work for those factories somehow uh, have less uh, inclination uh, to perform a protest vote. You do control for regional variables and everything. But, but, but anyway, uh, uh, maybe just you could not identify the right kind of driver of of this of this uh, slide, but uh, but I think this mechanism would explain better what's happening. Yeah, if a region is doing better, take Krasnodar. Yeah, people are happy. Yeah, so they are not uh, interested in in, a, in 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 marginal uh, participants only to show authorities that they are unhappy because they are happy. All right, and then in regions that are depressed, of course, you see a lot of and those regions that are depressed are not getting the spare bank loans. I mean, this is the whole story. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. If, if you can, please keep the comment fairly short. Sure. Uh, it's a very interesting story what you find there, but from the economic point of view, it's quite a stretch to explain that the law was given just a few months before election for the economic growth. Because it's, you know, it takes time for economic growth to be the comment, previous comment on the statement that uh, the developing regions are getting more loans, but not really resulting in the effect of that in better development and better vote. So it's 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 interesting finding, but the explanation probably is not what you're trying to put in there. Okay, uh, cool. Uh, first, the first thing I want to say is we control for higher private sector share and not cost in every regression. So a lot of the comments that were made that maybe it's because this high private sector limit, it's controlled for. So that cannot have any influence in any regression. Um, I like most of the comments. I th thank you for, for that stuff. Um, about excluding Moscow, you have to exclude Moscow. Uh, you cannot see whom they landed. You cannot see the firm. Exactly. Yeah, okay, I, I'm not, not sure. No, but no, the point is the most. Uh, so, okay, we want to control for the prospects of the regions by looking at private domestic banking. So if it's true that those regions are too better, the private bank should also not only is better. So if you could for the private bank's domestic banking, we use the little bank data. You cannot exclude Moscow, but Moscow has all these banks that land to other regions. At that point in time, they're all in Moscow, so it's easy While the banks in the regions only land to their own region. So this whole idea of prospects of one of the controls is the change in lending in exactly the same months by private domestic money. So the prospects of this control for that, essentially. I like the comments about the mechanism, but I'm a lot more cynical. There's even evidence in 2012 in a very large survey that up to 40% of managers of private firms uh, would describe themselves as political activists and rallying in their firms for the right candidate. So that sh and, and, and that's published paper. So it's not too strange to expect that the management state firms have political preferences and express these preferences. Of course, people are free, and you cannot control the vote. And what is it? And I, I truly believe that. But the, there is a whole zoo of possibilities between controlling a vote and influencing people. You can explain to people that this part is good for stability. You can show your preferences. People uh, in Russia could get influence, and by the presence of the 
of the discussion piece of the, of the manager. So I think uh, the mechanism ma makes more sense. It's not a one-to-one -one relation, but it's about influence. Who do you get to influence? And I, I do believe that's a, that's a possibility. The alternative story about some regions uh, do better it will be very strange for, for many region, reasons. First of all, it's not to win any month except the months before the election. So we do not expect any growth channel. We don't expect the lending money to grow and that we expect the lending will give a reason for managers to do their political activities. That's the idea. They get, they, they, and actually we, got, we want to look at wage reviews. Do they use the money to pay down wage reviews and say, look, we got this low wage reviews, what do I get? That's, uh, that's but I'll stop here because I uh, and would you send me slides? Sure, they're very nice. Thank you very much. And it's it's and probably the yeah. bribery, the economic influence, the political incentive to make it. So, so, so just exactly what you just said. It's just a little bit more bribery done by the political connection instead of the Thank you very much. Uh, this is certainly something we need to continue during, during the coffee break. But now it's, it's time to move to the second paper of the session. Marisa Minova will, will discuss a paper on market discipline in Russian regions. So please, floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much.